I'm Mike DeLuca. Welcome to this rare In the Trenches look at the craft of screenwriting. Today I'm joined by Paul Atanagio, who's written the screenplays for Disclosure, Quiz Show, and Donnie Brasco. The last two earned him Oscar nominations. He also created the landmark TV series Homicide and serves as an executive producer on the hit TV show House. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for coming by. Thanks for inviting me. Now, did you get your start as a film critic for the Washington Post? That was my first job in the film business, was I came out of school, I didn't want to I didn't want to be a lawyer. I came out of law school. And oh, what a surprise. A lawyer that comes out of law school doesn't want to be a lawyer. I know. More than half my class, actually. And I got a job as an intern at the Washington Post. And they had made the mistake of firing their film critic before they had a replacement. So they were dangling without a film critic for over a year when I got there and said, make your internship into an audition for this job. So I wrote about 20 reviews and at the end of it they gave him you know, Ben gave me the job and I was there for 84 to 87. How did you just know to, how to write a film review or did you just kind of... I had done some of that stuff oh. in college, um, college and in law school. I had done some freelancing for the Boston Phoenix and the New Republic and Esquire and I had written for my college paper but I didn't know right. is really the truth is I really didn't know and <clears throat> it was kind of exhilarating and terrifying to do this in front of 750,000 people every week and learn on the job. Can you tell us your favorite, you know, your favorite rave and your, your favorite pan of that period? I was just really snotty. I was like the guy that you would hate <laughs> now because um, I was, you know, I was 24. Right. And anything that was product, I just despised. By product, you mean like a Anything film without a, a sensibility right. behind it. That's kind it. of just a program that yeah, the studios shove out. Yeah, we need, to, mm -hmm. we need to feed the pipeline, which right. I would say is about 90% of what they're making right now. Right. Maybe 95. Um, I despised. And, but even other films. I mean, I, I remember I reviewed Clan of the Cave Bear, and my last line in my review was, yabba dabba do. <laughs> it, was like, it was just, that was right. the tone. <laughs> Did you end up having to work with anyone you panned in your, in your life as a critic and have to explain it yourself? It was always very awkward. Um, actors always remember. <laughs> Did anyone step to you with like, hey, remember that review? I met Tom Hanks at Show West when, uh, after, after Quiz Show and Diamond, that year. Were you not kind to Turner and Hooch or something? No, uh, nothing in common. Oh, OK. And you know, when I was not kind, I was just brutal. Was that the Jackie Gleason film? Yeah. Okay. But it was such a weird encounter because he came up to me and he's shaking my hand and he's saying to me, you've come a long way. And I don't know what he's talking about. He's saying, <laughs> you've come a long way. The insect that is a film critic too. Well, then I finally right. found out from mutual friends that this nothing in common review was lodged in his brain. And for all that time. For all that time and I think still is. They just don't forget those. Who knows? I mean, you could, have been, you could have been responsible for his desire to pick better material, and thus... That's might, how I you, like to think of it. You might have influenced him on to Philadelphia and Forrest Gump and all that good if stuff. If it wasn't for me. Was it a tough transition to go from being a film journalist to being in the line of fire yourself? It was... It's hard to write screenplays. You know, part of why I wanted to leave was it's... I wouldn't say it's easy to write film reviews, but it's relatively easy to know whether a film's working or not. Um, you know, the audience evaluates the films. And so to be articulate about it is just all that remains. To make a good film, to write a screenplay, it's surprisingly hard. It shouldn't be that hard. You know, you're really creating a diversion for people for two hours. Right. But because of the length, and it's almost like writing a villanelle or one of those forms that's got so many requirements that to, to hit the marks you need to hit and to express something is incredibly hard. And then, you know, the result is there's like a handful of people who know how to do it. Did you always kind of hear the siren call of, of movies or drama or kind of that element uh, in, in play in the, in the back of your head in terms of where you'd eventually be in your career? Was it always, were you always like a fan of movies? I really grew up with books. You know, I really come out of that. I'm not one of those clerk in a video store guys. Right. You know, I was really, 
I read a lot, and my foundation is still literature. And trying, which is probably a foolish thing, to try to give the kind of depth that you get from a, a literary experience to film. Mm -hmm. You know, my earliest mentor was Joe Mankiewicz, and he was just amazing. You know, he came out here when he was 19, so his experience went back to writing titles for W.C. Fields. Oh, wow. So, um, like title cards? Or yeah, you know, the titles, yeah, the title cards, That's you know, Silent Era. Mm -hmm. You know, his brother was out here, he came out here. Herman Mankiewicz? Herman was out here. He came out here, he was 19. Mm -hmm. And by the time he was 25, he was producing the Philadelphia story. So his history went so far into film history right. that it was, there was just this wealth of wisdom to draw on. Oh, that's great, and he kind of became a mentor yeah. for him. You've done a lot of adaptations. Um, what draws you to that mode of, of, of screenwriting? Is it, is it on purpose, or is it just kind of the way everything worked out? You know, if, you, if you're adapting something, you're starting with something, and everybody, all your colleagues, you're kind of in the same sandbox. So it's, an, it, it, it's a way to know going in that you all have the same aspirations. It's a little more fleshed out than an idea. Do you enjoy it? Yeah, you know, adaptations are all different. In other words, Quiz Show was a chapter in a book. It was really not fleshed out. Um, Donnie Brasco was, you know, again, and it was the lefty Donnie relationship was a chapter in a much longer book about Joe's experiences undercover. They're all different. Right. You know, disclosure, I had very specific marching orders to follow the plot. How you do it and what qualifies as a quote unquote adaptation or not is mm -hmm. they're all over the map. But there's a little little bit of a germ to start with that, that at least that's people. What I like about it is there's a germ to start with. What I like is at least in some thematic sense or some you kind of know what the locations are gonna be. It, you're in some kind of ballpark. Mm -hmm. Have you written any screenplays on spec on the other side of the the coin? Yeah, I've written original screenplays. On spec or on assignment? I've never written on spec. Okay. I've always written on assignment because, again, part of what you're doing as a screenwriter is you're trying to get a bunch of people to make a movie. Right. So if you're writing on spec, you're starting from a dead standstill. If you're writing an assignment, well, okay, you have somebody, you have people invested in making that movie. You know, if you're a high price screenwriter, they're more invested. So ultimately, you're trying to get those elements together that will actually put up the money, direct the movie, star in the movie. And working outside of a dialogue with those people just feels harder. Mm -hmm. You know, when I work with directors, I work very closely with them. Um, for the same reason, and by the time the screenplay is turned in, we, we all know the movie we're making, and they've contributed, mm -hmm. and so it's not that throwing this baby over the transom saying, here, you deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's a better process. Because there's more of a, of a will to get something done. It's already been you know, signed off on, at least conceptually, by the people that ultimately are going to finance the film. Yeah. They have to be aboard. Right. Where do you start uh, in the process in terms of an adaptation like Donnie Brasco, where you know you're, it's an adaptation, but obviously there's an amazing amount of fleshing out to do because you are taking one slice of of that book. You know, when I started Donnie Brasco, it was um, first of all, it was right at the beginning of my career, so I was just really grateful to have a job. Was it before Quiz Show? In terms it was of before Quiz Show. Okay. It was the first thing I did with Barry Levinson, and really that experience with Barry, you know, Quiz Show came out of that, Homicide came out of that. It was fundamental to my development as a writer because all I had been hearing up to that point, I'd only been out here a couple of years, but what I'd been hearing up to that point was a lot of that kind of Sid Field, Robert McKee right. kind of... Cookie cutter structure thing. Yeah. And Barry's, Barry basically, if you wrote a funny scene, that's what he was looking for. And it was really like the Howard Hawks 
apothem that a good movie is five or six scenes and something in between. Right. And that was how Barry developed, was if you had the five or six good scenes, you'd figure out how to... The connective tissue. Yeah, you'd figure that out. The structure would announce itself. That was eye-opening for me. And when I felt, when I found that I could do that, um, that was the experience of Donnie Brasco. It was really zeroing in on this character lefty. And what was great with that, too, is there's a lot of tape because mm -hmm. they're eavesdropped on by the feds all the time. Oh, so yeah, that's interesting. So, so you, you can get it in through the ear. You can hear what left. You could understand Lefty through how he sounded. And there was just all of this tape. And, and it was that relationship, and the basic spine of it was, was clear to me early on, which was at the end, he had to either betray himself or betray his friend. Mm -hmm. That's all you really need to then find the structure. When did you know that you had the five scenes, kind of, that, that you had enough to, to craft an entire screenplay? You, Barry, would laugh. <laughs> it was as simple as that. It, was, it, was, it, made it, it made the process so much more human. Right. You know, you'd write a scene, and he would laugh, and he would say, that's a great scene. And it wasn't about, is plot point one on page 24 to 26, it was... Much more intuitive processing, yeah. I imagine. What were the five scenes, or what were the, what were the four or five things that, that you knew you could, you could put that connective tissue into? I, there's scenes early in the movie. There's, uh, there's the scene where you know, Lefty shoots his mouth off and then makes Donnie, and then becomes convinced that there's a bug in the car. There was the scene early on when he's watching The Nature Show and... Uh, those were the, the scenes early on where he, Barry felt, okay, like I see sort of the relationship and what it's like, and it's not, it, it fit with what his vision of it was from the beginning, which was not the Godfather. Lefty has this wonderful Willie Loman character, like yeah. almost quality to him that you guys really captured well. What he got from the book was that mob life is really about guys in coffee shops scheming and bullshitting. Right. So that spoke to Diner and Tin Man and, right. and a perception about people that he has you know, mined for a while. Right. And that it wasn't the Godfather and the beautiful Gordon Willis lighting <laughs> and the dignity of, yeah. of those guys. It was low life. Mm -hmm. Then you know, what, what I found in there is the relationship that, that, that gave that some heart and some emotion. As part of your process, is there a, a lot of outlining that goes on in terms of breaking down a book uh, like that or the other books you've worked on before you start I'm writing? I'm a late convert to outlining. I used to try to really know where I was going to end up and then feel my way through it. And, you know, and, and Soderbergh, when we did The Good German, said, no, why don't you outline? And I was at the point where my process had gotten so amorphous. It wasn't quite as amorphous as my friend Alvin Sargent's, but it was semi-amorphous. And I said, okay, I'll try that. And it's, it's good. It, it, what it gives you is, it's like having a road map on a family trip. You can still, you still, what happens is the kids have to go to the bathroom, you leave the road, you see something interesting, you go to it, then they're hungry and you go there, but then when you have to get back to the highway, you know where the highway is, um, or at least you have a general direction to find your way back to the highway. Writers who stick rigidly to an outline and never go up those blind alleys aren't real writers. But on the other side of it, if you're collecting scraps of paper, you can take a long time to write a screenplay. Are there any challenges to adapting someone else's work, an author's or a reporter's or whomever, but are there specific challenges to, to kind of adapting, period? You know, in a strict adaptation, you can have, because I really would separate out, like when you're adapting something from historical material like Quiz Show or from a real life story like Donnie Brasco from a quote unquote adaptation, which really, strictly speaking, is like Disclosure or East of Eden. Right which present different challenges. You know, disclosure, you know, the, disclosure was interesting because it was, 
it was a very quick process. Barry signed on to do the movie. They had a window to shoot with Michael Douglas in April, and they had a release date in December, and they had no screenplay. But they had a the very good plot in the book. And it's almost like the way Michael writes, it's like a neutron bomb right. has detonated in his books. There's no people. There's no recognizable humans in the book, but the plot is all really well worked out. Right. So you need to populate it. And so that was my job, was simply to populate it and to get it done in 10 weeks, which was <clears throat> fun. Mm -hmm. East of Eden is somewhat different because it's a, it's a huge, sprawling saga. It has three generations. Right. Um, and it's John Steinbeck. And in some sense, it's the book that he won the Nobel Prize for. He felt it was his crowning achievement. So there's a kind of a care that you have to take and, and then make it into a film. Because he had so much more on the page than a, than a, than a pop novel or a Well, it would be novel. like a 14-hour right. miniseries. And we're trying to make it into a two-hour movie you know, or a two-hour and change movie. And um, you almost have to imagine the movie that John Steinbeck would write if he was a screenwriter. And that takes a lot of work. That sounds like a challenge. And it requires some chutzpah because, you know, I'm not John Steinbeck. But you have to get into that space where you go to work every day and it's like, I'm John Steinbeck. Right. Because that's what would honor the book, is really to write it as he would write it. Actually, not to pay a kind of phony respect to it by following every jot and tittle of the book, but to make a great movie out of it. Apart from John Steinbeck, who you couldn't consult with, have you ever consulted with the author of the source material or the journalist involved with the articles? on? Yeah, the I got to know Dick really well when we did Quiz Show. I got to know Joe Pistone, a real life Donnie Brasco, well, um, I think it actually s inhibits the process a little bit just because you become sentimentally attached to the people and you really don't want to be sentimental, at least I don't want to be when I'm writing. Um, you know, a good thing with Quiz Show was that Bob Redford knew Dick for years from Democratic Party politics and had more objectivity um, and wasn't, you know, he's just not sentimental at all. And so he was helpful. Would you find that uh, consulting with these people was fruitful ultimately? You would sometimes learn things that were interesting. Like uh, I remember going to dinner with Joe with my wife and my wife, we came out of the dinner it's interesting, Joe always sits with his back, he sits in the corner and he sits with his back, even... In case there's know, a hit. In case there's a hit, yeah, basically it's that old habit. Right. And we came out of the dinner and my wife says to me, his upper lip doesn't move. And sure enough, like when he talks, his upper lip doesn't move. And it was part of his scary demeanor. He had that kind of dead eye thing that this, you know, the real Italians have. You know, Al Pacino does it, like where his eyes go dead. Right. Um, yeah, I just watched Godfather 2 again, scary. and it's all scary all through the second half of that yeah, movie. Yeah, they just go, yeah. And, and then he has this thing where his lip doesn't move. And I said, oh, that's what it was. Because you read in the book about, Lefty makes a joke about how the mobsters are more scared of Donnie than they're scared of him with his 26 hits. Right. And that was part of what it was, you know. So you do start to... You're trying to understand how did this guy get away with it? He was undercover for five and a half years right. as a mobster. He almost picked up tricks an actor would pick up for himself as an undercover agent to intimidate or pull the gangster thing off. Yeah, but it, was, it wasn't really an actor. It wasn't acting. It was him. Right. It was him. You know, J Johnny spent a lot of time with right. him. But Joe's shot past even being an actor in his situation to being like an Oscar-winning actor. Right. Because <laughs> everyone, everyone bought the routine. He was, mm. he was living it. Do you feel any pressure from them, either real or imagined, uh, when you're kind of honoring or, or retelling or putting on screen real people? You do really feel an obligation to uh, be truthful. And again, I don't, I don't think 
it doesn't mean following every single fact of what happened. But, if, but you do feel an obligation to be truthful to what those people did or didn't do. So for example, I didn't want to show uh, in quiz show anybody behaving well who actually behaved badly or behaved badly who actually behaved well. You know, it's important to honor the, to sort of honor what they did in the truth of it, not in the day-by-day -day facts of it. But there's a larger meaning that you want to stay true to. Yeah, absolutely. Do you, do you invariably end up combining or condensing characters and time frames? Yeah, time frame you absolutely have to condense. And you know, even something like East of Eden, which is, it's on my mind more now because it's what I've just finished. Um, you need to collapse things because you just need to get into that two hour right. time frame. And, and what does that correspond to, depending on the style of your movie, what is the time frame of that? Right. You know, it could be many years, but you have to make a choice and then, and then you have to make adjustments yeah. to fit that choice. So I want to discuss a scene with you that you cited as a particularly strong example of your work and uh, it's a scene from the film Quiz Show and it's the scene where Charles Van Doren played by Ray Fiennes is uh, sharing a late night piece of cake with his father uh, expressing his worries about competing on the show. Was that based on a real event or did that come from the research or did you invent that kind of out of whole cloth? How did that come about that scene? I brought that scene up partly because of how it came about which oh, is great. it came about from the collaboration. You know you had a situation you had a character who had done this incredibly self-destructive thing, which is he had the Van Doren name, and, and part of that was the dignity of telling the truth, and he went on a quiz show and sold his birthright in a very kind of mythic, biblical sense for nothing, for a quiz show. And by the end, he gets caught, as you'd imagine he would, and almost probably wanted to get caught. Yeah, because he does it in the context of a federal investi investigator bearing down on him. You know, the, the challenge of the movie was to find the heart in it. And the, the heart really was that father-son story. And what we needed was, what Redford said to me is what we needed was a bridge from the fact that he did this thing and the fact that he ultimately had to confess to his father. We needed something in between and he said what about a scene where he has the opportunity to tell his father the truth and he doesn't. Yeah, You're trying to basically illuminate the emotion in that relationship and trying to explore the, the guilt and the things that are not said. You know, what's so interesting to me about writing screenplays is it's all about what you say and also what you don't say in the screenplay. And the fact that the, this father and son couldn't talk to each other, the fact that he was bearing this terrible burden and he couldn't talk to his father and his father really wasn't interested or at all clued into what was going on, the torment that his son was in, was, there was wonderful, terrain there, but if I hadn't been pointed there by Redford, it wouldn't have been in the script. So it's part of what I really love about my job and about movies is you're not alone. You're not in a Garrett painting, and maybe those painters aren't either. You're working with other artists and you're all trying to make each other better. So Redford as the kind of custodian of the whole picture steered you towards what he needed and then you, you know, kind of created what you thought would do the job. He really, you know, he just really got that character. It was really, you know, the, the kind of golden boy who has been handed everything, who bears this burden of guilt and insecurity. Mm -hmm. He so understands that. He made a whole career out of that character. So he was incredibly useful to draw on, to just give me that germ of an idea which then, you know, I tried to run with and tried to... Uh, Articulate. Yeah, what dramatize. To when you were faced with the assignment of crafting that scene, where did you start? Like, when you sat down to write it, what kind of came first? What started first was... I started with the dad. I started with what I considered the father's abdication. The whole idea of 
the dad being clueless, the dad having put this burden of expectation on his son and being clueless to how his son was suffering under that burden of expectation. I could hear that really well. And so I started with that. And I started with the cake because I just had a very strong, I guess what an actor would call a sense memory. Of sharing cake, cake. with your father? Uh, no, of like oh, going just home at night and, <laughs> and the, my mother's cake, it was in the refrigerator and it had stayed there for a couple of days and you came home late at night, it was pretty great. Nothing better? Even you would think so. <laughs> I like cake 24-7. I'll see if I can get her to make one for you. <laughs>